I may invite you to turn in your Bible with me to uh, Romans chapter 8. It's where we'll start this morning. It's good to be free. Amen? It's good to be free. I don't know about you, but I am enjoying the Christian life. I am loving it. You know, the Bible says it's not only been granted to us to believe, but also to suffer. And so we know that as we walk with Him and as we choose to take a stand on truth, that there's going to be a lot of challenges, a lot of challenges. But when you study and you research the church around the world, okay, everybody tune in for a sec. Okay, you ready? When you, when you research the church around the world, the places that the church is thriving the most are places that don't have this. Did you hear what I just said? That they don't have buildings. They don't have worship services per se like this. and They don't have programs. They just have each other. And most of all, they have Jesus. Because they, they have been persecuted to the point they, they can't eat meat openly and so forth for fear of their life. And, you know, take that. But that's... You, you, you do some research and you study the church around the world, that is, ladies and gentlemen, where it's thriving. They're not sitting over there yawning, you know, looking at their watches, ready to go, and all that garbage, man. They're just, man, people are being saved. And, you know, when Jesus is all you got, and that's when you begin to realize he's all you need, amen? You don't have to have all this other stuff. All this other stuff is, is, is a blessing, and I'm not criticizing it or demeaning it God can use it but it's sad that we have all this and yet most of the time we miss the most important thing and that's him and so um, I, I want to share with you some good news today uh, we continue uh, just just working through the idea this theme of salt and light Jesus says to his disciples that carries over to the church you are the salt of the earth you are the light of the world so let that sink in for a minute. I mean, when you think about salt, when you think about light, man, they make a difference. So Paul, or excuse me, God is, is saying there that you and I, as his followers, we matter. We matter to the people around us. And because of him, we have, we have great potential. So we ask the question then, God, help us, show us how to become who you say that we are. So how do we do that? So we've been thinking about that, and we want to continue to think about that, and I don't think we'll ever stop thinking about that. But Romans chapter 8, verse 29, gives us a peek into God's design for his people, for the church. So Romans 8, verse 29. 29 okay matter of fact let's just I'm going to read verse 28 I'm going to throw that one in it's too good to leave out but it says this and we know that all things work together for good to those who love God to those who are called according to his purpose so when I look back at my life and I think about all the many different challenges that I've gone through. And if you're interested in finding out a little bit about those, I'll be glad to sit down and tell you sometime. But when I think about all those things, God, you mean really all things work together for good? To those who love God? To those who are called according to his purpose? Yep. Verse 29 for whom he did foreknow, he also predestined. What did he predestine us for? To be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. A lot of great verses in Romans chapter 8. I don't, I'm sure you have difficult days. When you have a difficult day, Take your Bible and just turn to Romans 8 and start reading. And I promise you by the end, grace will have so lit up your heart that no matter where you stand, I believe 
you'll be filled with reason to rejoice. But God's destiny, his design is for us to be conformed to the image of his son, the image of Jesus. Now that the old man has been crucified, now that we are alive in the spirit with Jesus Christ indwelling us, this destiny, his design can now take place. And that's good news. As a child of God, I can be conformed into the image of Jesus Christ. The word conformed means to be made like unto. Okay? The word conformed means to be made like unto. We derive the English word morph from this idea of being made like something else. We're being conformed into the image. The word image means a copy, a representation or resemblance. So let's put it together. God's design is for us that we be made like a copy or representation of Jesus Christ. So what's God up to in the life of the church? Making us more like Jesus? I want you to think about this with me for just a moment. Matter of fact, turn with me to Matthew chapter 9, if you would. Matthew chapter 9, verses 35 and, and 36 provide us with a, a very brief summary, a little synopsis of the life of Jesus. And it gives us a little summary of basically what he spent his life on earth doing. Okay, So, think about this. If God's design is to conform us, the church, into the image, a copy, a representation of the Son, of Jesus, then I would only conclude that the things Jesus did God desires to see done in my life as well. Matthew chapter 9. Synopsis of the life of Jesus. Then Jesus went about all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues, preaching the gospel of the kingdom, and healing every sickness and every disease among the people. And when he saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion for them because they were weary and scattered like sheep having no shepherd. So let's read on. Then he said to his disciples, the harvest is, is truly plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore pray the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. So what you have is that brief synopsis of the life of Jesus. And it's interesting that when you look at what he did and you look at what the church does today, the two are drastically different. And it's almost like we just kind of want to sit around and we want to expect everybody to come to us but Jesus was out. He was with the people. He was in their homes, in their cities, in their villages, and he was connecting them with them on a spiritual level, and he was seeking to help them physically as well. So he cared about them. He saw them. They were weary as sheep without a shepherd, and so he had compassion, and he ministered to them. Jesus says in Matthew 28 at the very end of this gospel, he says, go and make disciples. Not sit around. Not just sit around and talk about the Bible and talk about Jesus and talk about what we should do, what we shouldn't do, but go. You guys have heard this translated. It's beautiful in the Greek. It's basically saying as you go, as you live your lives, I'm just going to continue doing through you what I did when I was here. And so through you, now I'm going to go to all the cities and all the villages. We're going to preach the gospel. We're going to touch lives physically in an amazing way. And you're going to watch me continue my life through you. And I don't know about you, but I'm excited about that. I'm excited just this week at people that God has crossed my paths with that probably will never come to this church. But yet that he has obviously had a desire to minister to and to work in their lives and Never cease to be amazed at, at the love of God and the grace of God and the power that his word contains. 
How do we become like him? How do we become who God says that we are? How do we become those difference makers? I want you to write down these few promises that I'm going to share with you that hopefully can capture some of what I've been saying in a very simplistic way, okay? Several promises that I want to share with you that really matter, that are very important in understanding how we become who God says that we are. The first promise, Matthew 11. So if you're in chapter 9, just flip over a page or two. And there you'll find Matthew chapter 11, verse 28. Very common passage of Scripture. I'm sure it's one that you've probably heard read from the text many, many different times. Matthew 11, verse 28. The Bible says in verse 28, Come unto me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. Why? Because my yoke is easy and my burden is light. The first promise is you will find rest for your souls. You will find rest for your souls. How are you going to find this rest? How are you going to find this spiritual rest? Because in the midst of going back and forth with some of the Pharisees who didn't have rest, they didn't know rest in their heart because they were so busy trying to earn what God just wanted to give them. And so uh, in the midst of this passage, he asks people or invites people to come to him. He says, come to me. In other words, he's inviting them to enter a relationship with him. And so from this relationship, he is promising them that you're going to find rest. You're going to find rest. How are you going to get rest? Well, he says, I want you to take my yoke upon you. So when you go home today, pull up on the internet and just punch in these different, uh, in Google somewhere and punch in yoke or something like that, a picture, an image, and you'll, you'll see it. Some of you already have an image. Jesus is inviting people who are weary and beat down with trying to earn God's love and earn God's acceptance and earn uh, their right to be heard by God. He's inviting them into a relationship with himself. He's saying, hook up with me. Team up with me and notice what's going to happen. And this is critical as we think about how we become who God says that we are. Because he says, team up with me, enter a relationship with me. And he says, I want you to what? What does it say in the text? He says, I am, or excuse me, before that part, he says, take my yoke upon you and what? Learn from me. You see, he's inviting you into a relationship because in this relationship, God has some things he wants to teach you. God has some things that he wants to reveal to you. So you say, well, what's the big deal? That sounds pretty simple. Well, if you're like me, though, it's easy for us to substitute things in place of the relationship. And a lot of times what happens to us today is we want to substitute this. We want to substitute religious activity. We want to substitute just doing something or just helping somebody from experiencing a real, genuine relationship with God where we truly give him the opportunity to speak into our lives and to teach us about who he is and about his amazing grace. But, and he says in this process, guys, here's what he says. And these words are key and these words are critical because he says, hey, learn from me. I'm gentle, I'm lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. In other words, I'm going to take you on a journey. And as we walk together and as I teach you in the process, you're going to experience rest, spiritual rest. And I would argue that the only way that you're ever going to care about anybody besides yourself is to be set free from yourself through the spiritual rest that only God can give you. 
He's talking about the rest or the, the, the rest from feeling like we are in the position to have to live in such a way to get God to give to us. Because here's the reality of the gospel. God's already given the world everything. He just wants you to realize it. The prosperity movement says, no, you take your faith, you jam God in a corner somewhere, and you force him by the, by the, by the level of your faith to do something for you. But that's not the gospel. The gospel says it's already done. He's already blessed you with everything. Now God just wants to, to bring you into a relationship and show you how blessed you are. And by seeing the glory of his blessing, he's going to change you. And the Christian life is going to, going to begin to flow and, and come easy. And you're not going to walk around criticizing everybody. You're going to walk around seeing people for who they are. And you're going to have compassion upon them. And you're going to see their real need. And you're going to want to meet that need because you know Jesus Christ is the answer. And that's good. But here's the question, though. He says, come to me. He doesn't say, go to a building anywhere. He says, come to me. He's inviting you to himself. He's inviting you to team up with him. Take his yoke upon you. But he's the farmer, right? Just don't forget that part. Okay, he's not getting in the yoke and then letting you control things. No, he, you understand that, right? And he wants to show you these things. He wants to reveal your glory. And see, as a pastor, I, I guess when I first started, that the reason this is so important to me is because I, I did substitute, you know, uh, activity and doing things and all this kind of stuff for a relationship. And I'm the pastor. <laughs> and I'm supposed to one, have, be the one that has it all together, right? I mean, if anybody gets it, if anybody sees it, if anybody embraces what's right it's got to be the pastor right but I was miserable because I had substituted doing things and church activity for a real genuine personal relationship with him but you see you can't bypass that because the doing part will never become fun until the doing flows out of the relationship. So we've been talking about that over and over and over again, right? But to me, that's a beautiful way to see that passage. He's inviting you to learn. What is he inviting you to learn? He's inviting you to learn how blessed you are. That's it. But you guys know, we, we spend our time mainly using God like a genie in a bottle, right? We do. That's what we do, okay? We live our lives and we get in trouble and it's like, shh, 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 shh. Help me, God. I need you for this. And thank God because of grace and the finished work of Christ, he's there, amen? I don't, I don't want to beat you up about that. He's there. More than you realize he's there. But there's something more. And I don't know why this is so heavy on my heart. I, I don't know why, ladies and gentlemen. I don't know why. Because you might be scratching your head thinking, preacher, you need to move on. Let's go on to something else. But I'm telling you, God won't let me move on. So it might just be for one person. But this is where we are. So I don't want you to miss life substituting something for what matters more than anything. So let's move on to the second promise. The second promise is this. Matthew chapter 4, verse 19. You got to see this because this was, this was interesting. This is something you got to embrace. Not only that, that God has promised, you will find rest for your souls as you enter that relationship and as you let me show you how blessed you are because of what Jesus Christ has done. Secondly, I was reminded of another promise. Chapter 4, verse 19, that says this. Jesus walking along here um, by the Sea of Galilee, he sees two brothers. One, Simon called Peter. Another, Andrew. They're casting their net in the sea, and they're fishing. And he says to them, what does he say? Follow me. In other words, very similar to Matthew chapter 11. Follow me. Enter into a relationship with me. And here's what I'm going to do. Notice what it says. I will make you fishers of men. So what's so important about that promise? What must you embrace from it? What must you embrace from that? 
is the fact that so many times you and I are trying to do what God, what only God can do. We're trying to make ourselves be something that only God can do. And the only way that that, that that can happen is through a relationship with Him, through walking with Him, letting Him reveal His glory to you. But it's His job. So let me ask, ask you on this point, and I'm going to move on. Whose job is it to make fishers of men? Come on, church. Whose job is it? It's God's job. And man, you've got to embrace that. What a, what a, what a liberating moment for me, especially for somebody like me to embrace that truth. To say, God, it's not my job to stand up and scream as loud as I can to get people to care about the world and become fishers of men. It's not my job. God, God says I'm using you to help them learn about how blessed they are and about how good I am and how amazing the finished work of Jesus Christ is. That's how I'm using you. So you just stick to it and let me handle the rest. That's important. So when you think about becoming who God says that we are, it can't happen outside of a relationship with God. Guys, we missed this, and I've said this before, going to remind you, we missed the truth about the Pharisees. A lot of times we only see them as being those who try to destroy the life of Jesus, so they're the bad guys. But you've got to understand, within their society, these were great, great individuals. Study about them. They were fasting several times a week. Anybody want to raise your hand at the last time you fasted? And I'm not talking about for wrong reasons. I'm just talking about to just grow closer to God. Anybody? Anybody? These guys were doing it multiple times in a week. Praying all the time. Giving, listen, giving of their own resources to help poor people. Okay? So in their society, these were the good old boys. These were the boys, if you, except if you were Samaritan. <laughs> They'd give you the shirt off their back. And that's kind of the way we are too. We'll give you the shirt off your, our back as long as you're not black or Hispanic or anything else, you know, whatever it is. We rip them up, so that's just a little side note. You don't, that don't cost you anything, but. A lot of similarities. It's good old boys. We forget that. We forget the fact that, man, they had the law. They had the truth. And they were doing the best they knew how to do at the time. So don't think I'm taking up for them or trying to say they were right. We just missed that. And think about it, y'all. They're wrapped up in everything, all kinds of good religious activity. And they're missing Jesus. They're missing it. They're missing it. Second Corinthians, the last promise that I want to cover. So let's think about it. We're thinking of, again, hey, how do we become who God says that we are? It's never going to happen outside of relationship. Matthew 11, Jesus invites you into that relationship. He says, team up with me. He says, team up with me and let, learn from me. Just give me the opportunity to reveal to you how blessed you are. Follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. Are y'all with me? Is that, I mean, can you, you, you grasping that? You got it? He says, I'll do it, okay? I'm going to do that. I'm going to turn you out to the world. And I know you guys, man, you, you know how to physically fish. You can do it with the best of them, but I'm going to, turn your life upside down, turn you to the world, and you'll become a, a fisherman of people. But I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it through this relationship. Now, 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 17 and 18. Okay? This is, this is critical. This is a critical, critical passage of Scripture. Second Corinthians chapter 3. I'm sorry I keep messing with this thing. I have messed something up, I think. There we go, it's a little better. 2 Corinthians 3, 17, 18. I tell you, I encourage you, dive into 2 Corinthians chapter 3. Study it out. Let God teach you. This is an amazing chapter of Scripture. 
uh, one of my favorites. It contrasts the old covenant, new covenant, and just really highlights the glory that we're able to experience through faith here. But chapter 3, verse 17 says this. Now, the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. Amen? It's good to be free. Verse 18, but we all, that is the church of Jesus Christ, with unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord, are being transformed. What does that mean? It means we're being changed. We're being transformed into the same image. There's the word image again. We go back to Romans chapter 8, verse 39. We're being transformed into the same image from glory to glory just as by the Spirit of the Lord. Here's the word image. It's back. And here's also the word changed or transformed. This is the word from which we derive our English word metamorphosis. The word means to transform or to transfigure. The same word that's used to describe what happened to Jesus in Matthew chapter 17. So let's turn there real quick again. So you're like, whoa, we're all over the place. But Matthew chapter 17, you got to see this. Because here, Jesus, in her glory, shines forth on the outside. Now, you can't lose me here. Because this is, this is where you might check out on me. But I want you to really embrace this. Matthew 17, here we see the inner Jesus, his inner glory, shine forth on the outside. Now, after six days, Jesus took Peter, James, and John, his brother, led them up on a high mountain by themselves, and he was transfigured before them. Same word. Matter of fact, when you study it out and you look the Greek word up, it's only used four times in the New Testament. Romans chapter 12, 2 Corinthians 3, and then in the occasion where Jesus is transfigured. It's four times. And up on this high mountain, look at what happened. He was transfigured. There's the word. Before them, his face shone like the sun and his clothes became as white as the light. And behold, Moses and Elijah appeared to them talking with him. Then Peter answered and said to Jesus, Lord, it is good for us to be here. If you wish, let us make here three tabernacles, one for you, for Moses, one for Elijah. And while he was still speaking, behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them, and suddenly a voice came out of the cloud saying, This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. Hear him. And when the disciples heard it, they fell on their faces and were greatly afraid. But Jesus came, and he touched them, and he said, Arise, and do not be afraid. And when, he, and when they had lifted up their eyes, they saw no one but Jesus only. You see, because here's the reality. Everything that Moses had talked about, everything that the prophets had talked about, guess what? We're standing right in front of them. Standing right there. I'm here. See me. Hear me. Peter, James, and John had an awesome privilege in that moment to see the inner Jesus. Wow. To behold his glory, to behold the glory of the one who hung the stars in the sky. So think about this. The only logical reason in my mind that Paul used this word in 2 Corinthians. The only logical reason in my mind that Paul would use this word, okay, back over in, or later on in 2 Corinthians, was that he believed, he believed that the believer already contained inside of his heart the very thing that he needed to change his life. Paul's revealing the fact by using this word that it's already there. Are you with me? So in reality, what's already there, over time, God wants to present out on the surface. 
He believed in a transformation Paul did where who you are on the surface over time is slowly replaced by who you are on the inside. It's metamorphosis. It's being transfigured. So how does this happen? Well, he tells you in the text. So go back to 2 Corinthians again. We're in our little chase here. Good stuff. 2 Corinthians again. How does this happen, though? How does this metamorphosis, how does this, this transformation happen? I mean, is it really up to me, y'all? That's the issue. Is it up to me to become who God says that I am? Is it up for me to get up in the morning, grip my teeth, and say, God, I'm going to do it today and just be miserable? I mean, let's be honest. How many of you in your Christian life have at times just been miserable with it? Anybody just want to be honest? Just raise your hand. Just be honest. Just been miserable with the whole thing. Man, I've been there. I've been there at times. I thought, God, there's got to be more than this. And the truth is, there is. And so it's not up to me just to grit my teeth, you know? I'm going to do this today. I'm going to do that today. Some of you may like that, but that's... But I was telling somebody last night, you know, God allowed me to walk that path for probably four or five years of my life to just get me to the point to where I was totally sick of performance-based living. Because you know what I'm saying? You know, you, you'll do good for a while, and then you... Da, da, da. You do good for a while, and then you... Da, da. God, there's got to be more than this. Got to be. Yeah, yes, son, there he is. There he is. But you're not going to find it outside of relationship with me. You're not going to find it in religi religiosity. You're not going to find it in conforming to a certain standard of morality. You're not going to find it in certain traditions or conforming to sort of uh, different kinds of denominationalism. You're not going to do it. So how does this happen? Well, Paul says it. But we all, with unveiled face... We are beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord. And as a result are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory just as by the Spirit of God. So how is it happening? Because we now with unveiled face are beholding in a mirror as in a mirror the glory of the Lord. So what is he talking about here? Because you think about looking into a mirror, you're like, well, when I look in a mirror, I see me. <laughs> Does God want me to see my faults, my failures? No, he's saying it's beholding as in a mirror. But what are you seeing? What does it say? What are you beholding? The glory of the Lord. Right? You're beholding him. You're, you're seeing him. You're walking with him. You're in a relationship with him. And what God is doing is he's teaching you and he's revealing himself to you and he's showing you how, you, how blessed you are as a result of his finished work. So as you're beholding, seeing, that's what beholding means. As you're seeing with your own eyes, your unveiled eyes, and simply we could go into a very detailed study about all of that. But the bottom line is this. It's the reality that now we see what the entire Bible was all about, and it's Jesus. And it wasn't about God just throwing out a few rules and things for us to conform to so that God would in turn bless us and give us salvation. No, it's all about Jesus. It's all about Jesus. So the veil's gone. We're not blinded anymore. We look it, we open it, and we say, yeah, man, from beginning to end, this thing is about Jesus Christ. And as we study and as we read and walk with God, he gives us the opportunity to behold this glory. And in the process, as we behold the glory of the Lord, as we gaze at his beauty, at his loveliness, the more reflection that changes we might resemble him. 2 Corinthians 4, 6. I'm just going to read it. For it is the God who commanded light to shine out of darkness, who has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. Crazy, right? 
Are you saying, preacher, really, that my role in this process of becoming who God says that I am, this process of transformation, is for me to see more of him and his glory? Absolutely. But I would say that that's the very thing that we oftentimes substitute religious activity for. Oftentimes we, we just substitute truly walking with God, being in a relationship with God that exists beyond this, because if this goes tomorrow, I still got everything that I've always had, amen? And, and I'm not at any least disadvantage. Are you with me? I, I'm not at any disadvantage if I don't have this. Because let me tell you what's going to happen. When we don't have this anymore, the church is still going to gather. It doesn't matter. But we make an idol out of this. We worship this. This consumes what we think of a lot of times as the Christian life. And so what I'm thinking is this. You bear with me. But you know, if God really desires to turn people truly back to him, what is one thing that he might would do? Take this away from us. Because where's the church thriving? Do your research. It's thriving in the countries that are being persecuted, that are not allowed to, to worship openly and publicly. And here we yawn on our watches. Well, let's go, let's, you know. The idea of the unveiled face, tremendous study and learning about Moses and the veil. But today in Christ, the veil is gone. So we look at Scripture, even the Old Testament. We don't see a God of, of vengeance and hate and death and all these things. We see Jesus. We see amazing grace. And I'm not to demean the fact that God is not serious about sin, but there's no place that's, that's more clear about how serious he is about sin than how his son suffered and died. If you don't think sin's serious, if you don't think your decisions to do what you wanted to do and go your own way are serious, then you study the suffering, the death of Jesus Christ. But today with unveiled face, we don't look at the Bible and see a religion of human achievement. We do not look at it and see a list of things to do to make ourselves right with God. We look at the Bible and we behold, even though it's different for different ones of us, we behold the glory of of Jesus Christ. Because we know, as verse 17 says, where the Spirit of the Lord is, and where is it? Right here. There's freedom. There's liberty. To know God, to love God, and to walk with God. My prayer is that you can see this idea a little more clearly. How do we become who God says that we are? It's not going to happen outside of relationships. And ladies and gentlemen, I mean, I, I don't want to put bondage on you, but I'm just trying to help you understand. He says you will find. In other words, he's taking you on a journey. It's not just a one-time deal. He's inviting you to that relationship. Walk with me. Learn from me. Let me reveal to you who I am. Let me reveal to you how blessed you are. Walk with me. That takes time. As a matter of fact, I think that that lasts until the day we breathe our last breath and we see him face to face. I don't want you to miss that. So, no hands. Or How many of you are missing that? How many of you have substituted something, whatever it may be, for that? Because if you are, you're missing it. I'm living proof. I'm, a, I'm an example. I've been all these different places, and it's real. It's not just a crutch for us to lean on because, you know, life's a little difficult. It's real. I will make you. Follow me. I will make you. I will turn you out to the world. I'll make you a fisher of men. I will do it. Come and now with unveiled face, let's, let, me, let me enable you to behold and see the glory of Jesus as you're looking in a mirror. And the longer you do it, the more his reflection, the more what's inside of you is going to, to be seen on the outside of you. You're going to be transfigured. So will you enter into that relationship? The one that Jesus suffered and died. That we all might enjoy. Enter into the relationship. Allow God to change you from the inside out. Let God turn you to the world. 
God make you a fisher of men. I've been in both places. I've been over here and I've just, I've got up and said, oh God, I've got to do this today. I've got to do this because I'm supposed to do this, God. This is just what I have to do. And now today I stand at the place to where honestly, man, I, I'm just so excited every day of what God's going to show me and do. Who's going to cross my path? I, I, I'm just telling you, that's it. Christian life is, is fun. It's exciting. It's not without suffering and trials, but there's nothing that can replace it. So I don't know about you, but as I think about all these things, I'm just reminded of how glorious Jesus is. Because the truth is, is if I need the relationship, as Jesus said, nobody comes to the Father except by me. He's the door. His finished work opened the door. His hands are open. He's not angry anymore because Jesus Christ swallowed entirely. So don't you run out here demeaning the finished work of Christ. He swallowed, he drank the cup of God's wrath entirely for the entire world. It's gone. And so here he is. And he says, where are you? Why are you hiding? I'll cover you. Come here. Who's telling you all those things to make you think you're this or that? Come here. Let me show you something different. Don't miss it. Don't miss it. Don't trade it for anything. Because for some people, if this were gone tomorrow, they wouldn't have anything. They wouldn't know what to do. They, they'd be wrenching their head. Oh, I, I can't live the Christian life. I, I don't know what to do. I, I have nothing to do. Oh, my goodness. And at that point, they would have to really learn what it's all about, would they not? And I don't say that mean. I say that with great compassion because I've been there. And God wants to rescue you out of that and show you what it's all about. You agree with me? I hope you do. Because God's speaking. Some of, some of you might be here today and you're just continually dealing with that. I don't know if you're saved, all those things. And I tell you, God wants to clarify it for you. God wants to give you peace. But you've got to give him the opportunity to do it. You've got to start somewhere. So will you walk through the door? The one that he opened. Let's stand together. Father, your grace is beyond what I could ever imagine. Lord, your grace is, is abundantly greater than all of our sin. So Lord, when we think about that, God, there's, there's really nothing that we've ever done, nowhere we've ever been that, that should hinder us from this invitation. And it's not an invitation really to come forward, God. It's an invitation to come to you and embrace you. So, Lord, I'm grateful for, for people who come here, and I'm grateful for what goes on here, Lord. But I do know from experience, and you know in my own life, that sometimes we can substitute this for what matters more. So my prayer is, God, may we not miss Jesus. May we not miss the purpose for which he came, and that is to suffer and to die, the just for the unjust to bring us to you. So God, may some people here today embrace, embrace you. Yoke up with you and begin an amazing journey. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.